Our next partner has a product I literally use every day. I'm not joking, you guys. This year, I was looking for something, a new supplement to take to give me energy, to make sure that I'm getting the vitamins I need and also the greens that I need. With a schedule like mine, sometimes health can go first. And so I wanted to make sure that I started the year out right. So I am taking Athletic Greens and it has been great. One of the things that I love about it is that it comes with this awesome packaging where you can have travel packages. And because of my travel schedule, I wanna make sure I stay on my routine when I'm traveling. So this comes with a nice cup that I can take on the go with me and my packages and take them in the morning and I'm all set. And I can incorporate this into my travel schedule. The lifestyle of AG1 is friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free, all the frees, whatever you call it. This, this one is safe for you to take. It supports mental health, clarity, and alertness. And that's one of the things I've noticed a difference with me having more energy and just being at my best. Um, and I think this is helpful for you. Your subscription comes with a year's supply of vitamin D, which is so important to add in these winter months when you don't get as much sunlight. And this is really important for those with us with melanin skin, where it's harder for us to get our vitamin D. In 2020, AG donated over 1.2 million meals to kids in 2020. And so not only are you getting your supplements, but you're doing good because AG is donating meals um, to kids across the world. Um, in 2020. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient and daily nutrition, especially heading into the flu, cold season, the Rona season, all of the seasons. It's just one scoop in a cup every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. You just take this one scoop and there you have it. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packets with your first purchase. These are the ones that I use. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash BTB. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash BTB to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Believe me, you will not regret it. Be the bridge, be the bridge. You are listening to the Be The Bridge podcast with Latasha Morrison. Doing today. It's exciting. Each week, Be the Bridge podcast tackles subjects related to race and culture with the goal of bringing understanding. But I'm going to do it in the spirit of love. So we love. believe understanding can move us toward racial healing, racial equity, and racial unity. Latasha Morrison is the founder of Be the Bridge, which is an organization responding to racial brokenness and systemic injustice in our world. This podcast is an extension of our vision to make sure people are no longer conditioned by a racialized society, but grounded in truth. If you have not hit the subscribe button, please do so now. Without further ado, let's begin today's podcast. Oh, and stick around for some important information at the end. Hello, Be The Bridge community. This is Latasha Morrison, your host for the Be The Bridge podcast. And I'm so excited to be with you today. Um, you know, there's some things that we do each quarter called Take It To The Bridge. And so um, this is where we highlight um, some of the um, partnerships, um, some of the programs and trainings of Be The Bridge. And so um, today I am excited to really talk about TRA, our ch transracial adoption, um, you know, training that we do with Be The Bridge. And I have some of the fabulous... Uh -huh. ladies in the room with me today. We're actually live doing this in, in person. We are in the same room. Uh, we're in the same room and typically we're doing this over Zoom so it's great to have them here live in the Atlanta um, studio. Miss Gina Fimble. Hello. It's great to be here. And we have the gorgeous Tiffany Hennessy. Tiffany Hennessy. That's Hennis. right. All the way from Oregon. Yes. It's nice to be here. I was about to say Hennessy. Hennessy. <laughs> we have the she gorgeous the Tiffany <laughs> Hennessy. 
Okay. And so uh, we're just going to talk about all things TRA and, um, you know, what it is and um, the vision for it and like why we started it. And um, and then we're going to, I'm going to just ask some questions, especially to um, Gina and to Tiffany. And um, Tiffany can talk from her own experiences. Mm-hmm. And we think it's important that we empower those where this is their lived experience mm-hmm. to do most of the talking. Mm-hmm. And so we do not want to silence those voices um, because they are not voiceless. That's right. They're just unheard. Amen. So... Mm-hmm. Um, so the overall vision is one of the things is when we started Be the Bridge, we had um, just a group of women that um, was a part of the organization. Um, all of them had adopted transracially, and so they were interested in justice work. They were in- interested in reconciliation work mm-hmm. um, because of their experiences with their children. Um, they wanted to be better parents. They wanted to identify blind spots. They um, wanted to make sure that they're doing the best um, for their children. So their intentions were really great, you know? And so um, in, in doing that, we attracted a lot of people who have that same story because there's really been, you know, um, a push in the evangelical space of um, taking care of an, an adoption, um, you know, dealing with foster care, um, orphan care, all of those things, um, which is, we should do that. Um, but we have to make sure that we're looking through the correct lens and we're not doing more harm in our effort to do good. Mm. And that tends to happen a lot. Well said. So um, I, you know, that is the overall vision. Uh, it's just looking at the gaps and what people need. And, I, and and we had so many leaders and Be the Bridge that this is their story, mm-hmm. um, whether they've adopted or they're adopting. And we wanted to, to really speak into this space because we get a lot of emails and, <laughs> um, you know, tags on Facebook. On, on social media mm-hmm. of people who are trying to figure this out, grandparents that are trying to figure this out, mm-hmm. relatives that have, you know, um, children of different ethnicities in their family now mm-hmm. um, and trying to figure this out so they can mm-hmm. create a um, safe and brave and courageous environment for um, everyone, you know, mm-hmm. especially um, the children that are a part of their family. So mm-hmm. um, I am not an expert in this. Um, I like to find the experts <laughs> and let them do their expert things. Um, <laughs> you know, that I think that's great quality leadership right there is to, um, I, that's not my experience. That's not my story, but we can give the mic and give, uh, make room and create space and give up space um, for people where that is their story. And um, that is the story of Tiffany. And go ahead, Gina. Well, I just want to qualify that I am not an expert (laughs) (laughs) because I'm a white adoptive parent. Uh And so because of that, I know that I have blind spots and I know that I've had to Mm -hmm. really lean in and get uncomfortable and seek out voices intentionally. Mm -hmm. Um, And so although I may have experience in child welfare or a degree in social work, I'm not going to qualify myself as an expert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) I like that. And I I mean, and I think that speaks to um, a lot of parents out there where we have conversations and they feel like uh, they know everything about racial justice and anything about the the community um, that maybe their um, child was adopted from because of that experience and that you know, just mm-hmm. because you have um, a black child or Asian child mm-hmm. in your life, that does not make you an expert. An expert. Absolutely. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And I want to speak to you. So this is Tiffany here for folks, so folks can get to know my voice. Um, no, but I want to speak to your leadership, Tasha. Um, I think that one of the things that attracted me to be the bridge, or I should say kept me in the community, was the intuitive sense that you have for what it means to center the marginalized voice. Mm. And I saw it in person. You came out to speak in Oregon. Uh, The first time I met you, it was a lunch and learn thing. And uh, a woman in the audience had a question about cross-race parenting. And you like gave me this big old side eye. You looked at me, you knew I was there. (laughs) Uh And then you said, we actually have a transracial adoptee here who's done stuff with Be The Bridge. And so I'm going to have her answer your question. Wow. And you 
up there, you're teaching this whole hour while we're eating lunch and we're listening to you and we're telling stories and she's seeing you as the person to speak into this thing, but you recognized in the moment, there's actually somebody else here who needs to answer this question. And you literally passed me the mic for a minute and a half. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> sure that's Tasha. That's Tasha, it, but right? Yeah. But I think that's, um, that's an important thing because when we're talking about race, we might know that we need to center um, the particular ethnic group that's the most at the heart of the, of the particular discussion that we're having but sometimes that um that knowledge doesn't transfer to when we're talking about adoption and people don't always think well then we need to go find an adoptee or someone who is adopted Mm -hmm. right they think oh well anybody who's adopted a kid knows but there's a lot of us who were adopted and we are here fully grown adults (laughs) with a lot of thoughts and knowledge about our experience And we're trying to speak into these spaces, especially where our experience as an adoptee and um, as BIPOC is overlapping. And the fact that you just have this sense to, okay, we're talking about race, but when it crosses this line of being about cross-race parenting or interracial, I'm going to bring in somebody who can speak to that from their experience. Mm. And that's your leadership. That's why I'm here. That's why you have Gina here who is a white adoptive parent, but she knows how to engage in the conversation with humility and a posture of learning. And that's why I'm very comfortable working with both of you and feel um, very empowered Mm. by the work that you've done. So thank you. Thank you for that. I I remember the... You know, my memory is short, but I, you know, <laughs> and this was just a couple, like a year and a half ago. Um, but I, I really think it's important to pass the mic, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to create space. And, and, I, and I understand that as a leader that we cannot be an expert in everything. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to try to fake it till I yeah. make it, you know. <laughs> I mean, I would do a disservice, you yeah. know. And so there's things that, you know, you're teaching me. There's things that I learned from Gina's experience because she's mm-hmm. in this, you know, mm-hmm. um, the day-to-day that she can help and advise, you know, um, other parents. But, um, you know, she has a different perspective in this and you have a different perspective in this and yep. I think it's important that we highlight those perspectives because also the adoptee community is not monolithic oh, you no. know <laughs> and so <laughs> and you are all yeah. different and there's different stories different situations um, that maybe there's some things that are common mm-hmm. um, but you know your experiences are distinct and you know and I feel like um, you bring valuable perspectives to this. And Mm -hmm. so um, I think it's important to center those voices. And so those of you who are listening, and if you're talking on this and you're not, um, you know, this is not your lived experience, then I think you need to take pause and really think about this. And um, I know, and then there's a journey of, um, there's this progression of maturity. I think there's a lot of people who, you know, did this, you know, because their hearts are are big and, you know, they, they've done the right thing, but then I think you've grown in it too. Mm -hmm. And I think sharing those experiences, and I know Gina, um, you share some of those experiences, um, with us a lot, you know, what has that journey been like for you as a parent? Yeah. Well, it's been a very humbling journey. I will say that. Um, I think so often when we go into adoption as prospective adoptive parents, we hear things like love is all you need or that there is an orphan crisis. I mean, who wouldn't want to help in an Mm -hmm. orphan crisis? I now know that that particular phrase, uh, phrase is not actually accurate. Um, but, but yeah, ultimately, um, what we, and we being potential adoptive parents and adoptees, we need more than that. You know, we need a perspective of adoption that tells the truth about adoption, um, as a profitable industry. And I hate to say Mm. that, but it's, Mm. it's true. And we, we really need to hear the voices of adult adoptees themselves, voices that have been historically marginalized within this system of adoption. And so 
Um, you know, we often talk about adoption in such a simple way, black, white, it's all unicorn and rainbows. And I think that's a really dangerous and problematic way to frame it because it really severely limits the public's perception about the complex dynamics of adoption mm -hmm. and the trauma that's associated with it, not only for uh, first families, but for adoptees as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. when people talk about race, it's not a black-white binary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with adoption conversations, we can have similar issues where somebody sees adoption as either you are a grateful adoptee or you're an ungrateful one. Wow. There's nothing in between. Or uh, some even, you know, folks who, who see adoption itself as either it's good or it's bad. Mm -hmm. mm. And there's a lot of adoptees who we live in the in-between of, well, it wasn't fully good. It wasn't fully bad either. Um, mm -hmm. And that can be a difficult conversation to have. But when we're thinking about that, I like how you said that, you know, it's not, there's not the binary there because um, some people will tend to think, oh, well, I know someone who was adopted and it was good for them. Mm -hmm. And essentially when they come into that conversation and we're talking about the difficulties of adoption and they say, well, I have a friend who was adopted. Like, Did you just, I have black friends, me? <laughs> you know, it's just similar. You know, they're using um, one, they're universalizing one person's mm -hmm. experience, their one touch point with it to mm. minima minimize the people who are trying to have open and nuanced and complex conversations. Yeah. And because Be The Bridge is so good at understanding the, the social interaction of why we don't do that, why we don't say I have black friends, why we don't mm -hmm. universalize an individual person's experience, why we don't think all Asians are monoliths. Right. That framework, I think, is a huge reason why as an adoptive person, I've been able to come in to Be The Bridge spaces and find the space to talk about that particular part of my experience mm. in a healthy way and be heard and seen. Yeah. And do you find, Tiffany, that it's hard for adoptees um, to even talk about their experiences because, you know, they will, um, you know, make their parents feel bad or oh, yeah. maybe they're in, you know, it's an inward struggle, you know. And, and so I know you're trying to create some safe spaces for adoptees to kind of talk and share because some people have never shared this. I mean, yeah. we, we just did a thing on um, Colin Kaepernick. Yeah, and so I would love for you to speak <laughs> to just that question right. and then also like how um, maybe the movie kind of identifies with mm -hmm. his um, kind of journey in that. Yeah. So the question again was difficulty. Yeah. Like with adoptees um, having um, difficulty um, finding a safe space where they can um, express themselves because they, they can't go to their parents. Um, you know, or it feels like, you know, like betrayal in a sense, but it's like there's some nuances where there's, you know, parents like Gina who is really trying to learn and educate mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, and really <laughs> dig in. But then there's some parents who did this, they love their children, yeah. but they are just ignorant to the fact of racial, um, Reality. Reality, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, yeah. and, and, th and they ha they live this colorblind appro approach mm -hmm. where all you need is love, like what Gina said. Yeah. And so that is harmful, um, you know, to, um, to an adoptee, especially transracial adoptee. It is very hard um, and for any adopted person mm -hmm. uh, to find a place where they can speak freely. And when you add the layer of race, mm -hmm. so for transracial adoptees, we are typically almost always talking about um, a child of color who was adopted by white parents. That's mm -hmm. just the history of race in our country and the history of the welfare of adoption as a social um, practice, as a legal reality, as, a, as an industry, um, as, as Gina said. And so... When you put those two layers together, uh, yes, when transracial adoptees begin to just let it go and mm -hmm. we just start sharing, we do. We hurt everybody. We hurt our white family who is sitting there thinking, I've not seen this. I've not, I don't understand what you're saying. And, and then we know, you know, for some of us who sort of into it, what other people are feeling mm -hmm. or thinking, we know that's going to hurt them. We know our parents are going to think, you're telling me I didn't protect you. Oh, and it just crushes their mm. soul, you know, and we don't want to crush their soul. We don't mm -hmm. want to make them feel bad. But if we are honest about what we've gone through, that will happen. Mm. 
And then we could be on the other end of it. We could be talking with other BIPOC and we could be sharing how as an Asian person, I've never really felt like other Asian Americans have accepted me. Or, you know, we could be talking about how we don't feel comfortable in our own racial or ethnic spaces because we didn't grow up with the culture. We weren't enculturated into the things that everybody else in this room is sharing and laughing about. And I have no idea. I never saw those movies. I don't know that musical artist. Um, we feel very outside looking in to something that everyone assumes we know something about and we don't. Mm -hmm. So it is very difficult. And I think my experience has been the people I feel the most comfortable with uh, just sharing of myself and talking freely about my experiences, other transracial adoptees. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's very, very important that transracially adoptive people have healthy spaces where we can connect, mm -hmm. where we can um, be open and honest. And then when I talk with Gina, I'll share certain things with Gina as a white adoptive parent. I might not share everything. <laughs> I'll share some things where I talk with, right. you know, the Be the Bridge team and the people of color on the team. I might be, you know, share some other things, but maybe not everything. Mm -hmm. But when I'm with other transracial adoptees, that's where I have felt the most freedom to be me. Mm. Wow. That's Thank so you for good. Sharing yeah, that. thanks for sharing that. I, I when I was, you know, I know um, you, and I've heard you speak. And uh, when I was watching um, the um, special on Colin Kaepernick's life, right. um, one of the things that stood out, you know, just seeing it, and, and I wasn't there, like in all of those incidents when those things happened to you, but how he was able to capture some of those things, comments that were said, and I think. You know, those things are going to happen. Like, com people are going to say comments. Um, but the fact that his parents, they, in, in that space, as it related to his racial identity, could not be advocates for him, right. that was just painful. I'd like to say something yeah. about that really quick, if I could. Um, and I think the issue is that we are allowing a system to operate in a way that doesn't protect the whole needs of a child mm. because Colin's needs were not protected. Mm. Th there were conversations that his parents needed to have, things mm -hmm. they needed to know about race, about racial ethnic identity, and we don't get educated about that as potential adopted parents, even by our agencies. Mm. And so we really need a fundamental reform, I believe, mm. in the adoption system. Policy change. Yeah, no, I agree. I think the series, I really liked the docuseries because um, in my mind, I knew Colin was a transracial adoptee since he was, you know, up to be recruited. He was at the combine. My husband oh. was already talking about him. We've okay. been 49ers fans, <laughs> you know, for a long time. So uh -huh. I knew, I knew about Colin before he kneeled, you know, uh -huh. but you know, he's never been about transracial adoption mm. and that's okay. Yeah. But I loved that we got to see him. Uh, he was very involved. I read very involved in the process and how things were shown. He worked with Ava DuVernay a lot to make sure like his story. And I loved that his voice, because even though he's not been speaking about transracial adoption, that's not what he goes out for. You could see it in the way that they did things that his perspective as a transracial adoptee of even his interactions with his parents was centered. Yeah. And that was huge for me because I, I had questions. Most of the, the time when you see transracial adoption depicted in media, mm. it's primarily the perspective of the adoptive parents mm -hmm. being told. And usually there's a bow at the end. Everything turned out well. Yeah. Um, you know, um, and there's an opposite archetype too, but we won't get into that where okay. the adoptee is like a crazy murderer or something. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you know? yeah. That's another, that's another uh, trope. But, but I love that they showed a more complex and nuanced situation. They showed parents who were invested, who cared, but who also didn't know what they didn't know and the harm that it caused was evident. Mm. And, and so the way that they were able to do that helped me sit there and it hurt to watch it because it brought up, up some of my own stuff, but it also felt validating to watch it and see that this wasn't glossed over. This wasn't just uh, phoned in. Mm -hmm. Thought was put into the, right. the dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, and and that really meant a lot to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I know there's there's a lot of struggles um, in this. And I I think what are, what type of conversations are you having with other adoptees? And mm. Gina, I would love to know. Um, 
you know, what kind of conversations are you having with um, other parents and then also your children? Mm. Well, for me with adoptees, um, because I try to engage with the adoptee community online, sometimes we call it adoptee land. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You know, to be honest, most of us don't have a robust community of adoptees in our real life communities that we can get together with to have those conversations where we seem... We, we are seen and validated. So a lot of times we do that online. That's, mm-hmm. you know, if we didn't have Facebook, mm. uh, as much as Facebook can be frustrating, like it's a lifeline. Right. It's For some of us, it's the only tool we have mm. to find the community where we're reflected and where mm-hmm. we're welcomed with our nuance. And so when I so talk good. with other adoptees, um, there's a lot of hurt. Uh, you know, I think it's the same with any community that has been marginalized in some way. And I think it's hard because a lot of people listening to this probably have never thought of people who are adopted as a marginalized community. But for those of us, Angela Tucker calls us dissenting adoptees, (laughs) where we come and we bring forth something that questions and challenges and and speaks to we need to be aware of the harm that's being caused we need to be aware of the trauma that Gina was talking about we're the dissenting voices in adoption but we do see ourselves and have organized ourselves um, as a marginalized community Mm -hmm. and we are talking about uh, a spectrum of things like you would find in any community some people want to completely remove themselves they want to abolish adoption uh, as a as a legal reality as a social practice altogether you have some folks who just want to reform it you know we want to do the changes that make it more child centered we just want agencies to gear more toward family preservation first adoption last case resort mm-hmm. like you have this whole range mm-hmm. of people um, who have so many different, I'm pushing for this way, I'm pushing for that way. And it's good conversations to have. Um, But I think some of the times when when I'm thinking from my bridge builder framework, (laughs) right? I'm thinking, how are we having bridge building conversations, even within adoption? And definitely there's an overlay of race that makes the conversation more complicated. All of our intersectional identities make the conversation more complicated. I see a common... um, common ways in which we talk past each other. Mm. So as a, as an adoptee who writes publicly about um, adoption and tries to challenge the idea that adoption is rainbows and unicorns, love is enough, everything is good. I see people who come in and their understanding of adoption is a general view. It's unstudied, right? They have, just like with race, we have, everybody knows what race is because we've grown up in a racialized society, but we haven't necessarily studied it We've passively taken an information and then we operate from this. What does my heart feel about this? Okay. Mm -hmm. So some people, when they engage in the conversation about race, they're just like, oh yeah, it's just, we have different skin colors and that's as deep as it goes or that's as much as they know. And it's the same with adoption. Everybody knows what it is. If you tell someone you're adopted, they know what that means and they have their own heart feeling about it. Not because they've studied, but because they just, they're just they just operating out of their heart. This is what I feel about it. And some people feel great. Some people are like, ooh, I'm sorry. You know, it just it runs the spectrum. Then you have people who have studied it. Mm-hmm. So this is the studied view of adoption, just like with race. They read Ibram Kendi. They know where the race, where it came from. Mm-hmm. They know the idea of it. They know the harm that it's caused. They don't necessarily have a lived experience of being a marginalized, mm-hmm. you know, um, Racial in, in a marginalized racial group, but they have studied it, so they're operating from their head. I just we just did Enneagram stuff, so I'm thinking head, heart, body <laughs> here. Uh, but they're operating from their knowledge, and mm. so they have a more complex understanding of adoption because they know where adoption came from. They know that adoption has meant different things in different cultures mm-hmm. over the course of time, but the version of it that we have today has been very informed by systems mm. of white supremacy, mm. and so they get that or parts of it because they've studied. They've done some learning. They read about Georgia Tan, a problematic child trafficker who influenced adoption domestically here in the early 1900s, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then you have the people who their view of adoption is what they experienced. Just Mm. like BIPOC, my view of race is what I have lived, what has been done to me um, and how I've acted Mm -hmm. in this racial role or in this adoption reality. 
And so when you have those three people, if, if they don't understand each other, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I can say, yes, adoption is problematic. And the person with the unstudied view is like, what do you mean? It's taking care of kids who need a home. How is that wrong? Mm. Right. Um, and then I have to say, well, do you know the history? We, we can't have community without common, you know, memory, right? The George Erasmus quote, like we've got to do, <laughs> right. we've got to do our definitions work. We've right. got to do our glossary. Right. We've got to do the awareness, the acknowledgement, the listening, mm. the learning, the lamenting. <laughs> All of, <laughs> All of that things in adoption, yeah. just like we do with race. And then someone who has a studied view of adoption, who knows the history, but maybe hasn't necessarily experienced it, mm -hmm. they can cause harm too, because I can come in, say, this is my experience of adoption and this is my adoption trauma. I was an infant adoptee. It was the day that mm. I was born and I have these pre-verbal trauma, you know, and I'm using all these terms and words that are from my lived experience. And they're not necessarily going to be able to hold space for that if it doesn't fit with the knowledge that they particularly learned. Mm -hmm. Or me interacting with another adoptee who has had the opposite experience from me. Mm. Do we hold space for each other? Often we don't, <laughs> right? Wow. And in race, you get that same thing. You get maybe somebody who has studied, they know the history of race. They see, oh, race is a bad category. We need to be all about ethnicity. But then they talk to a black person who's like, there's no way I'm going to ever know what my ethnic ancestry right. was because of slavery. So my black identity is serving the function of both. And I'm not going to give that up just because you're telling me race is a category I shouldn't use, you know? Yeah. And so their experience is different. And with adoptees, it's a similar thing. Some people identify as an adoptee. It's very internal mm -hmm. to who they are. Some are like, nope, I am an adopted person. It happened once in my life, but I don't see it as affecting the rest of my life. Mm. Some people prefer not to use the adoption at all. Um, I, know so, I know a great adoptee author. She actually calls herself a displaced person. That's wow. the term she prefers, right? So we have to be careful. We got to know. People come in with a different view and perspective of adoption, wow. different terms. Some people hate transracial. They want to use interracial. I'm an interracial adoptee mm. and vice versa. Some people are like interracial. That's about marriage and choice. I had no choice in this. I'm a transracial right. adoptee, right? right? So we got to know and, and take the perspective, I think, of the bridge builder to stop. Let's do our history. Let's do our learning. Let's set our definitions. Otherwise, we come into the space and we're talking past each other and we hurt each other and we don't know how to engage. Mm. And with adoption, I see a, the same thing when we're talking about yeah. it. We need to listen to each other. Yeah. We need to know why do you use that term? Let me be curious about your difference instead of trying to correct you. Mm. Um, and so really, Be the Bridge has been such a great thing for me as an individual. I think the pathway for reconciliation that you've set up. It's the chapters of your book, right? Right. Um, it's, there's something to that framework that can be universally applied to so oh, many different areas yeah. of division I agree. and adoption. I see it. I see it applying that way too. We need to do that same kind of work for each other in adoption. We need to do that same kind of work for each other. We need to do that same kind of work for each other in adoption. Wow, incredible insights. Don't go anywhere. We're going to pause for a quick moment and we'll be right back. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. In this day and age, that is super helpful. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Be The Bridge listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash be the bridge. That is B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P.com slash be the bridge. Make sure you go and sign up. Thanks for staying with us. Let's get back to our conversation. So good, Tiffany. You're amazing. So I've known that for a long time, <laughs> but I'm glad you're shining so yeah. that other people can Aww. hear it through this podcast as well. Yeah. And so with you, like, you know, I know you're on a different journey, you mm -hmm. know, and I know there's a lot of women that are listening that, um, you know, that are learning from you because maybe um, they have a, a similar experience. Mm -hmm. And I, I just remember... Um, um, this couple came to me and they were telling me they were going to be adopted. I think it was from Kenya. Mm. Okay. And when mm. what they what they mentioned uh, was, you know, someone advised them, 
you know, um, and actually I think the person was there that like, you know, because they were just saying like, what do you suggest? And they were just asking me questions. I get that a lot, you know, hair and different things like that. But it's beyond that, you know, mm -hmm. and um, they said, well, you know, I'm going to raise them as African-American because I don't live in Kenya and I can't raise them as a Kenyan. Aww. And I just remember mm -hmm. thinking, and this was several years ago, mm -hmm. but I just remember like, so you're going to strip them of their ethnic identity. Could it yeah. be both and? Yeah. Could it be both and? Because certainly people are going to see their child as a black American. Exactly. But you don't want to completely sever the other tie of the child's right. first community of origin. That Yeah, that's sad. And I was just sitting there thinking like, oh my God, I wish I knew my community of origin and yeah. this child, you know, is blessed to have that. Mm -hmm. Although um, that system is fractured because mm -hmm. of system things, you know, but for them to know of that and to honor that. And so to me, you're not honoring that or mm -hmm. you're, you know, you right. see it as something that's negative mm -hmm. um, and you're not going to honor that in that life. And I just remember mm -hmm. like not, really having the words, you know, because mm -hmm. this was such a new conversation mm -hmm. back then. But, you know, um, I would just love your thoughts, you know, and if you've had parents come to you with similar um, Well, things. you telling that story does remind me of an experience that I had where it was early on. We had adopted our first child, but not our second. And uh, my daughter was in a class with another black boy who was also adopted into a family with white parents. And we were talking and she said something to the effect of, well, you know, I don't refer to him that he's black. I don't say that he's a black American. I say that he's brown. And unfortunately, at that time in my journey, I was stuck looking like a deer in headlights. I didn't know exactly what to say. I knew in my heart that it was wrong. Like my body mm -hmm. immediately sensed like this is not actually honoring that child. But um, yeah, that your story just made me think of that. But a lot yeah. of the bridge building conversations that I've tried to have with other adoptive parents is really just um, letting them know that they have to do the work. That's mm -hmm. work that I cannot do for yeah. them. I can point them mm -hmm. to that mm -hmm. work. That's part of why we wanted to create this guide for adoptive parents, because it is something that you have to be intentional about. You have to decide that you're going to allow yourself to be uncomfortable, right. mm -hmm. that you're going to allow yourself to be challenged, that mm. actually you don't know everything. And that there are people who know have the roadmap to a better way. And so mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest challenge that I see is adoptive parents saying things like, well, my child's happy. My child's fine. My child doesn't even think about race. You know? I know. I've heard it, that so much. Well, it's like, well, mm -hmm. first of all, your child is thinking at race, even if they're not able to verbalize that. But uh, second of all, as your child grows, if you're not having these conversations with them, mm -hmm. they're not going to feel safe to come to you. And I think that right. is the heart behind what my husband and I want as parents is we want our daughters. Certainly we realize the importance of them having mentors that look like right. them, mm -hmm. but also we want them to know that they can come to us to talk about race. Mm -hmm. If they had an experience at school, a racialized slash racist experience, wow. I want them to have the tools to be able to right. leave that interaction with their dignity still intact. So yes. yeah. And they can't do that if we're not having conversation. Amen. Mm. And speaking so as an adoptee who was the happy kid, who never asked questions about race or really had any concerns that were uh, externally evident, <laughs> mm -hmm. I grew up, I was, I was happy. We had uh, ice skating lessons. My, you know, we lived um, in a rural county. My older sister had a horse. We were playing, like, I was thinking about boys more than I was mm -hmm. thinking about <laughs> adoption or race. You know, I was a happy kid. And so I would have been the kid that some of these adoptive parents think of and, and be like, she's giving us no signs mm -hmm. that she's struggling, right? And there's so many reasons for that. Mm -hmm. But what I've come to realize now as a mother myself, as somebody who um, has a whole you know, lifetime of experiences now, and I, I need to pause and say, 
I didn't know the word transracial adoption until I found Be The Bridge. Wow. Like I didn't even know there was a word or a term. I didn't know that there were other people who had organized and had groups. I didn't know that there was anything. Wow. I grew up in a bit of a silo away from Mm. the adoption world. And I think that was harmful because I didn't know that there were resources when I needed them. But so that being said, thank you for giving me words (laughs) and tools for my own things. But right. That's, that's kind of the issue is like, you don't know when during an adopted person's life, this will become something that their body or their heart or whatever things they've suppressed or repressed or whatever. You don't know when it will become important Mm. for me. It became important when I had my own child, I was giving birth to a child it started making me think things and see things in a way I never had before. So I started asking questions about my own experience, my biological mom, what that meant. And that to me was the thing that, you know, pulled the plug and everything fell out. (laughs) And I was 32 and I've spoken with adoptees who it's not until they're in their fifties when their parents have died, their adoptive parents have now left them. Okay. And now suddenly their abandonment uh, issues are coming up. Their parents are gone now Mm -hmm. and they're realizing that's rooted in losing their first family. They Mm -hmm. have all these extra feelings and they're coming out of the fog, as we call it, coming into their awareness of the harm and trauma they have because of adoption. They're coming out of that in their 50s. So you never know when that's going to happen. And I think what adoptive parents need to hear is that if you lay the foundation you can't you can't push a kid to talk about something they're not ready to talk about yet. But if you lay the foundation in your relationship with them because you're aware, you've done your work, you're going to be better able to support them or set them up with the resources that when they become adult, I know you know how to find the resources because we've made that available, right? So that they don't go through a crisis alone, unable to talk to anybody, mm-hmm. um, so that they don't burn bridges in that crisis when they are yeah. um, spiraling. You know, I spiraled for a while and I didn't know how to have these conversations. I blew up at people because I was like, I don't understand and I didn't have resources. So, yeah, like uh, an adopted child might look and present. Like they're fine and they're Mm. happy and everything is good. And sometimes that's because they don't have words to, so they just, uh, you know, push it down and ignore it. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to do that. (laughs) It's easier to do that. (laughs) And sometimes it's because um, that trauma is so deeply buried, you know, there hasn't been something to cause it to surface yet. Mm. And that's something that if we care about these people, if we care about these kids mm-hmm. growing up into adulthood, we're going to recognize they need support for this with their core people over the course of their lifetime, not just when they're kids, mm-hmm. right? We need supports, um, people that we can talk about, spaces where we can talk about this, resources to talk about what does happen when your parents die or maybe you're getting a divorce and your core person is leaving you again and that's Mm. triggering your abandonment issues. Or maybe, you know, there's so many different things. So yeah, you don't, you don't know, but the the best thing to do is to get educated, to learn, Yeah, be prepared. Mm -hmm. What are, what are some of the, when, you know, we talked about some of the struggles, but um, you know, like the mental health part of this, like if y'all can speak to that just a little bit, I know we're going to have some follow up conversations, Mm -hmm. but I know um, I see this a lot because of the trauma of losing their, um, what do you call it? The first family, Yes. Um, you know, and just, you just never know even some of the um, hereditary genetics mm-hmm. things that, mm-hmm. you know, follow. Um, what what have you guys seen in this? It, it's not just the family, too, because for some, um, I'm a domestic adoptee, but when with an international adoptee, they didn't just lose their family of origin. They lost their culture of origin, their citizenship of or- their language of origin. Oh. There's so many things that... Um, end up becoming what we call a disenfranchised mm. grief. Okay. So it's, wow. it's, it's a grief that they have over a loss that, that people around them don't really recognize as a loss. Oh, but you were adopted into a great family. You got to move here to America. You had a pool, you got had horseback riding lessons and people see this, uh, the material things they gained or the loving stable family that they gained. But so few people are ready to sit wow. with us and acknowledge being taken from your country, losing your language, losing 
that was a mm. huge loss for you, even if you were only four months old at the time. Wow. And so, yeah, so when we have disenfranchised grief, we have somebody who is struggling with something mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically manifestations of it, and there's no support. Mm. Um, and then and another issue is is just recognizing that um, family reli- family separation, relinquishment, um, adoption trauma. Not every person who's adopted is adopted into a great home. Um, they there's a lot of adoptees who talk about the abuse they suffered or the fact mm. that you know they were adopted because of infertility, but then when their biological family did miraculously have a biological child, suddenly they were ignored and just kind of mm. pushed to the side, right? There's there's a huge array of experiences, but um, you know, adoption is not on the adverse childhood experiences list, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. Like it's not, an, it's not an ACEs score. It's not something that people will um, screen for when they're talking with you about your life experiences. Right. And so I have had to learn to advocate for myself a little bit and saying, for me, I was adopted at birth, but that was an experience of family separation. And so I count that as an adverse childhood experience. And then, you know, the mental health community be, can, can log it in there in the way it makes sense to them. But there's not a lot of um, adoption um, trained or competent therapists to really help us when we go through that. So mental health professionals can not knowingly, but they can cause more harm. Right. Like think, think about, mm. you know, as, as, a, as a woman of color, think about going to a white therapist who doesn't know about race. Mm. You'd be like, not going to see you. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> thank Goodbye. you. Oh, no, thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Um, mm-hmm. And so for adoptees, we kind of experience that same thing. When we mm. go to talk about our problems, that therapist is never going to say, ah, how is your adoption related to that? Mm. They're going to be like, oh, you're insecure and you feel like an imposter. Well, we need to do some things to help you see yourself. But are they going to wow. know that there's a layer of adoption related to this right. and we need to mm. get into that? Maybe they will. Maybe they won't. And Gina could probably throw some statistics at you about, uh, I know. She's I'm going to leave the statistics person. to her. But there are yeah. statistics about adoptees and mental health and suicide and um, and things like that, that in the adoption community, we take that very seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, and unfortunately for those of us who engage regularly online, we recognize when someone in our community hasn't logged in and we Mm. haven't heard from them and someone's like, please check on them because we've lost too many. Um, we do adoptee, adoptee remembrance day every October about the adoptees we've lost to suicide. So, um, You know, there's there's a, a scary feeling of realizing for some of us when we went through the biggest crisis in our life, all of mm. these mental health issues, the ways that we get pathologized. Mm-hmm. There is an adoptee, um, um, an Asian adoptee who was killed by the police mm. um, and his story has been on the news. And um, with the way they spoke about him in the article was he was adopted uh, into this loving family, but then he had trouble bonding with them. He had reactive attachment disorder. Mm. And it sort of, to me, it put it on him, that there was something wrong with him, when really, in my perspective, Mm. he was a kid taken from his country and community and he was forced into the arms of these strangers that he didn't know. (laughs) Mm. That was not his problem, that he couldn't, attached to strangers in a whole other part of the world, right? Like, why did you put that on him that it was somehow his fault that he had this disorder? Mm -hmm. No, he was doing what most kids would do if you took them from their families, flew them halfway across the world and said, this is your mom and dad now. And that four month old, four year old would be like, no, (laughs) Right, right. right? They would resist that. And that's normal that we would resist that. And so, um, you know, there's so many ways in which we talk about it that actually leaves us under-resourced, mm. um, un- under-supported, or we grow up and we realize the people who've been closest to us our whole lives, mm. well, we're not just talking about our best friends, our mom, our dad, <sighs> our brother, our sister. Yeah. And then we're going through a big struggle. Who do we want to go to? Our family. And yet these families are not equipped to deal with that. They take it personally. They get mad. They get mm. defensive. They get hurt. 
And so what do we do? We either keep it to ourselves and struggle with it alone, right. or we have to we have to go find another community. And at this point, I advocate for all adoptees having an, a community because wow. <laughs> uh, we're just not there. We're not there where um, adoption agencies are going to start training hopeful adoptive parents on this. You know, we're right. not there um, where non-adopted people who, you know, haven't even thought further, they have a general unstudied view of adoption, know... Um, are aware or think that these things are worth uh, a reform or effort to change. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I'm I'm hearing a lot. You know, where we're talking about adult adoptees, but you know, mm -hmm. I'm all about you know not going downstream, but you go upstream. And mm -hmm. I'm just thinking, like, you know, I know there's some parents out there now that are listening that, like. My child is still in middle school or mm -hmm. high school or, you know, upper elementary. And I would love to have them um, be a part of a community where this is being talked about mm. at a young age. So they're not having the challenges that some of the adult adoptees would have. Just like you would, you know, do any type of counseling or therapy um, for your child. Like, but this addressing this specific need, the uniqueness yeah. um, to that and just having a support system knowing that hey I'm not you know I'm not alone in this because maybe mm -hmm. in their community they're the only ones but when they're connected wider that is more um, I mean is there anything like that out there? There is and I would say so if you want to go upstream I'd say let's go further let's talk mm -hmm. about family preservation and not taking yes. kids from their families mm -hmm. to begin with if, we, can, if we don't that's have That's really to. upstream. That's really yes. upstream. I mean those are the conversations <laughs> we need to be having yeah. though. It's right. time. Yeah. Far yeah. past time. Far yeah. past time. Yeah. And um, I mean right now if, if folks know about the Indian Child Welfare Act which is meant to keep indigenous children in their communities as much as possible it's being challenged. People want to overturn that because mm -hmm. they don't want um, to have this prevention that a that an indigenous child can't be adopted by a white family, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but the, if they don't, but know, they the don't history, know the history, that's what I was about to say mm -hmm. of why that... Why that's in place. Yeah. Because 25 to 35% of those children were being removed from their indigenous When they had family and culture. Yes. And a mass exodus taken, yes. of children yes. taken yeah. and put into white families. And and yeah. Yes. 85% of the kids that they removed had a relative yes. that was fit and able to care for them. Yeah. And that's why we have that in place. And it, it needs to stay in place because we yes. have not fixed the problem. So we need to, like, <laughs> listen, like, if you're listening to this you, yeah. and when you hear this in conversation, this is why those those policies are put in place mm -hmm. as a protection. Mm -hmm. And so um, seek out your um, your political leaders to make mm -hmm. sure that this is something they're not looking at this from one view. I know people who have no connection to their history, their native history at all mm -hmm. because this was done, yes. you know, and the trauma that it has caused in the indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's important. I want to know, Gina, what is something, you know, as you're in this space and you were instrumental in creating this TRA guide um, for Be The Bridge um, for us to support, um, um, you know, people, families, organizations, um, people who are training in this. Um, what is... You, what is the greatest thing that you've learned on this journey? You know, um, just... Just something that you, I know there's probably a lot that you've learned. And I know I just went off script, um, you know, and um, I, I will do that. But I just, you know, just, just, you know, just something like, you know, what, you, what mm -hmm. have you learned? I know your kids, you surround your kids with a lot of um, different people. Um, I've met your children. Um let Auntie Tasha. Yes, let me tell you. <laughs> oh, yes. Come on, you got that Gucci. <laughs> <laughs> you know, little girl's like, what you teaching your little girl? Like, um, but, um, you know, I've had an opportunity to spend time with your children. Um, and just well-rounded. And I'm just, you know, you, there's something 
you're doing and um and and I know you know there's a lot of different things I know but I'm just like what is your your great lesson because I know sometimes I talk to um, people who have adopted and um, because they've grown in this and they know information now and they all are they're about um, you know preservation of families now and um, but they didn't know this until they got into this so mm-hmm. you know they they advise differently than you know than where they would mm-hmm. have 10 years ago or, mm-hmm. or so. Um, yeah. But what is something that you've learned from, from this that you, makes you an advocate and that made you, you know, want to write this TRA guide and, um, you know, just um, make sure that you're not only equipping yourself, but you're, you're also, you're wanting, you have the desire to equip, equip mm-hmm. others. Wow, Tasha, that's a great and big question. Um, I do want to clarify that I did not write the TRA guide alone. In right. fact, I was very intentional to seek out adoptee voices yes, because yes, I do that's believe true. that's such a critical component. And you have been a advocate for that, even from the beginning, that, hey, we're doing this. We want to create um, a blueprint, but we need an adoptee to um, to to do this work. Mm-hmm. I do not want to do this. I am not. I mean, you've been very clear. Gina's um, running in one direction. Tasha's yes. like, come back. Yeah, she <laughs> and, still want you. Yeah, she 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 was very clear about that. And then also when it came to the guy, yeah. you know, I think for me, and this is more on a personal level instead mm-hmm. of a professional level, but I've really been doing a lot of work on myself throughout this mm-hmm. journey. And I don't mean that in a narcissistic way, but really like interrogating myself. How do I show up into spaces? And I believe because I've been a white woman in this society, I have um, I haven't been a great listener. Mm. And so I really have tried to cultivate listening skills. And I know that's a really small and simple thing, but when you listen well it will change your life. Mm. And in fact, I tried to listen to people who rubbed me the wrong way. Mm. Maybe in the way they said it, maybe it felt really harsh. I've had a lot of tears about all of these issues. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's pain, but it's most painful for adoptees and their first families, right? Right. But um, that would be my advice is really lean in, really challenge yourself, do the work because... For me, it's been worth it, and I have to believe that it's going to be worth it for someone else too. Right, that's right. good. That's good. That's good. And I want to say too, because I didn't um, when you asked Tasha earlier, like, what can we do for kids now to help set them up better? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure folks listening are like, I want to know the answer to that. You know, um, there are spaces, but I think it's important for adoptive parents, especially not to approach that as what can I do to prevent my kids from having the problems that these adult Mm. transracial adoptees are talking about? You can't, unless you can go out there and fix white supremacy today, Mm. you know, unless you can go out there and fix patriarchy and Uh capitalism today. We wish. wish. (laughs) Um, I mean, you know, be the bridge. We're doing our little slice of the pie over here, Right, right? but you can't prevent them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I, you know, you adopted a black kid. Can you prevent them from experiencing race? No, you can't prevent them from it having this harm. But what you can do um, is as it first, I think it starts with you. Like you just said, you did your, you've done your own work and that's why you're able to come in with the posture that you do. Mm. Okay. And that's why, you know, like, so you do that as a parent that becomes a family dynamic. Mm -hmm. So that person grows up knowing I can say these things to my family and they might need a minute before they respond, but they're not going to leave me hanging, you know? Um, And yeah, you can do things like groups that are adoption Mm -hmm. related, but in this world, being an adopted person is so rare. A lot of kids push back about being in those spaces with other adoptees. Just like when you're the picked on kid in the room, Mm-hmm. You don't want to hang out with the other picked on kid in the room. Mm. You're like, no, I'm trying to be cool. I'm trying not to get picked on. I don't want them to see that there's more of us, right? So when you're when you're the rarity, you don't often gather together because it makes you a bigger target. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing with adoptees, right? Mm. Um, and so sometimes you put adopted kids in those spaces, those culture camps, those things, and mm. the, and they push back against it. Okay, you got to be careful about that. You got to know your. You got to know the kid. Um, I think it's more important to have mentors, um, more important to have a family dynamic that makes space for that. Mm -hmm. And then as that child comes older and they come into their own story, they 
if they know that those groups are out there, they can ask to join them too, right? Um, but I do know some adoptees, especially Korean adoptees, since there's just a whole host of them that came over. Mm -hmm. There are some who found those groups to be with other Korean adoptees to be really healing. Mm. So you just have to know the kid. Okay, uh, so but, it's different. Yeah, it's it's different. different. You can't, you know, there's no prescription. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that's why I like the TRA guide that we have is because we give this overview of here's some of the issues. We're not going to tell you what to do. We're not going to say, do this, do that, everything will be fine. Right. But we're going to present you with the information you need to begin to have a studied view of adoption, to begin to make space for people who have different experiences of it. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have some of those bridge building tools to then navigate that with somebody. And that's, yeah. we're giving blueprints. We're not giving instruction manuals. <laughs> right. And we can talk, there's so much to say about this and we can talk about this forever, but I know we're going to have um, some more conversations about this. And right. um, there's so many resources um, um, for um, TRA families and, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I know we're going to have that as a part of this podcast. And if you guys want to say some final things, some things that I may have le left out and maybe... Um, speak to the resources and things. the one thing that I wanted to to share because I'm really excited about it. So we've had this guide kind of floating out there, right? Mm -hmm. And we've we've had, you know, I've tried to create space in my own community to have conversations around it, but we really we've noted we recognized here at Be the Bridge that there was a hole. So in other words, we're not we don't have a space that adoptive parents can come to to work through this information. Maybe they have questions about it. Maybe they want to wrestle with it. And, you know, we want them to have adoptees to do that with, adoptees who have done a lot of their work, who can walk into these spaces and really be healthy. Um, <laughs> Time for the party. Yeah. Okay. So start that again from like a few sentences back. Yeah. So we want to, we, we're creating a resource to have an online learning space to have white adoptive parents come to so that we can build a community and also a monthly live space to be together so we can, you know, maybe answer questions or bring in adoptee experts. Um, Tiffany is going to have a huge role in that <laughs> space. So I'm really excited about that. And we'll definitely let you know when it's going to be available, hopefully early in 2022. Yeah. And I will say, you know, for uh, November is typically National Adoption Awareness Month, which started to get people to adopt. Um, but what a lot of adoptees are doing is they're turning that month into a moment to flip the script. Mm. And they're saying, no, 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 let's not focus on why everybody should adopt. Let's focus on learning about the actual lived experiences of the impact of adoption on us. And so we get on, we mm. use our hashtags, adoptee voices, adoptee movement, you know, all of those. And we start sharing our stories and experiences. And so, but during that month, we as Be The Bridge, like we wanted to acknowledge that. So we help. we had some social media posts where, you know, I wrote them, but it, it was to speak to the adoptees, this, particularly the BIPOC adoptees. We see you, we see your voice is needed here. Um, we want to, we want to be in community with you. Um, so we also have a, a blog post on our Be The Bridge website that has some resources for transracially adopted people. Um, and, and, you know, we'll have other folks on this podcast, I hear, who, ha who are listed as resources. Um, but there are things out there. I'd encourage people, if they're looking for resources, to go see our blog post. And it's just a start. Mm. There are... There are folks who have um, adoptees who are mental health providers and those lists exist, okay? There's folks who have um, books written about adoption by adoptees, those lists. So there's a lot of resources out there and we're just trying to help point people toward them. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're coming to the Be The Bridge and you're wanting to talk about race and you're like, ooh, I need to learn more about adoption, we're going to point you to those other adoptees who are writing books or doing trainings. We're going to say, yeah, go listen to them. Go learn from them. Um, so there's a lot of resources out there. And, uh, and I would just say, like, you can start with our blog post if you don't know where to go, but mm -hmm. then you can go from there and it'll be a wonderful, <laughs> you'll have more books to read and more webinars to watch and, and things than you, than you wanted. But um, yeah, I, I encourage folks, even if you've not been impacted personally by adoption, there's a good chance about half half of us know someone who's adopted, even if we don't know that we know that, you know, like even mm -hmm. we don't know they are, but almost half half the world knows someone 
who was mm-hmm. adopted. And then you might not know how that impacts them. And there's a lot of things that we don't know we're doing. Um, so, you know, when we talk about, oh, let's adopt a family for Christmas because you're going to get them like a, you know, a gift or something. And some of us are as adoptees are like, oh, that feels so hard to hear mm-hmm. you say that because mm-hmm. you're just popping into their life to give them a little bit of something for Christmas and then hopping out. And, you know, and you're using adopt and adoption or um, there's an adoptee I follow on Instagram. She went to a market and they had a section for adopt an orphan cheese. Oh, wow. <laughs> and she was like, no, no, don't use that language for the last cheese you have of a certain kind. You oh know, like, what is that? And so I think if you love people, if you want to build bridges, mm-hmm. if you want to care for people in their hurts, Take the time to get to know and understand yeah. these things. Yeah. It's a social skill. It's a ministry skill. It's it's a heart skill for loving people well. Um, and I just, I appreciate you giving us the opportunity to share of these nuanced experiences. Um, and, and I really hope that it helps. I hope people yeah. read. I hope they listen. Yeah, we really have to stop <laughs> adopting um, vocabulary <laughs> from other marginalized yeah, yeah. groups. Like, it, it really does a disservice. So thank you so much, Tiffany, for sharing. And um, we're so excited to have you a part of Be The Bridge and that you're going to be leading um, our TRA community. Um, thank you, Gina, for all that you do. And um, pointing back, I'm not going to say too much because I know you don't like it, um, <laughs> <laughs> pointing yeah. back um, to others and I think that's just something you know that we all can you know mm-hmm. learn um, mm-hmm. from and we're gonna we're just getting started with these conversations there's more right. to come um, go check out the blog po- post and there'll be things in the um, the transcript um, and then you know I know there was um, a conversation around um, you know um, the Netflix special um, Colin in black and white Colin in yep. black and white um, there's um, some conversations we've had on that and there's a lot of things that we've done in the past panels and everything yeah. and like Gina said like these things are hard and there's sometimes like she said like I've had many tears and you know even her doing this work there's conversations she's had where um, it's been difficult for her um, but still leaning in um, you know crying in the midst mm-hmm. of it um, and just mm-hmm. doing the best um, that she can w- with what she's been given and you know what she's doing and I think um, this is just a start and and so um, you guys, you know, lean into it and it's hard and it's uncomfortable. Um, but, you know, this is helping us to be um, better stewards um, yeah. over, um, you know, all that we've been given, that God has given us. And then um, we want to educate ourselves like we should want that. You know, we don't have all the answers. And um, and so I think that's important in this conversation. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so Tasha. much to the Be The Bridge <laughs> community. You. Hopefully this will be a tool that you can use to um help yourself and um but then also pass um this on if this if this um podcast has been helpful to you make sure you share it with other people so thank you so much for listening to the be the bridge podcast go to the donors table if you'd like to hear the unedited version of this podcast thanks for listening to the be the bridge podcast to find out more about the be the bridge organization and or to become a bridge builder in your community go to bethebridge.com. Again, that's bethebridge.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, remember to rate and review it on this platform and share it with as many people as you possibly can. You can also connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Today's show was edited, recorded, and produced by Trayvon Potts at Integrated Entertainment Studios in Metro Atlanta, Georgia. The host and executive producer is Latasha Morrison. Lauren C. Brown is the senior producer. And transcribed by Sarah Conitzer. Please join us next time. This has been a Be The Bridge production.